All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Friday Takeaway Podcast. Today we have Vladimir Samborski, the COO of uh, Rocket Delivery or Rocket with the roots from Ukraine and now a uh, globally scaling company around the European Union and uh, hopefully beyond. Let's see where it goes. Um, Vladimir, uh, you have a lot of experience. Very excited for today's talk to discuss the industry, to discuss uh, the differences in industries worldwide. Uh, but to start with, uh, I wanted to start with your introduction and you are the best person to tell about yourself. Could you please share to us uh, where you're coming from? How did you appear? Uh, how did you choose uh, food delivery industry? And uh, your uh, quite a long and interesting journey in it. Started. All my story with sales, uh, basically concentrating on sales. I was really fond of financial markets. Then it kind of twisted into me working in Ernst & Young. Uh, but because I was so much fond of financial markets, I appeared in a department called Transaction Advisory Services, basically dealing with financial markets and were part of preparing companies to IPOs, which was pretty cool. And it was a very small department. And it was before the crash of 2008, so everybody was hyped about the markets, and it was something which I liked. And But there I, I got introduced to consulting, because that's what we were basically selling, you know, to prepare companies to go to IPOs. And so consulting became my new passion, because in comparison to financial markets, um, consulting in my view, created things, you know, so it's still a bunch of people, smart people doing something and then not just grabbing some money from other people in financial markets, but but actually creating something. Um, so after that, uh, obviously, financial crashes came after 2008. So IPOs wasn't interested, but I was so fascinated with consulting that I announced myself as consultant and started looking for businesses to drive some additional value to them. And being young, you know, and without that much experience, it was hard to sell the name of myself. So I used IT technologists to, to, you know, as an entrance point to companies. So like automating sales and different processes. Um, and that got me into a very cool experience of seeing different businesses from inside out and, and learning quite a bit. So anyway, coming back to, to food delivery. So like jumping between these projects, um, you know, some people got to know me and I was just basically proposed to, to take on a project called Equipar Service at that moment, uh, which was the first prototype of food delivery company in Ukraine. Um, it was a version one marketplace food online delivery, uh, meaning that it was an aggregator. We were just receiving the orders, passing them up to, to the restaurants, uh, and that's it. But it was a very interesting project in the sense of it was a venture project for people outside of the industry who saw that uh, on, in the West, you know, this was appearing and they thought that, you know, money could be there and they wanted to do some prototype to probably sell sell it to someone who might want to enter the market, which was very new to them as a whole venture thing too. Uh, so it was actually transformed from uh, a taxi service. We, uh, so it's funny. So they bought, bought out a small taxi service. So when I when I joined in, it already had kind of food departments, including sales, you know, two partners and uh, sort of small management of uh, couriers, which were we had very few and they were not hired and they didn't have bags or anything. Uh, so it was mostly product management, uh, which was mostly website. Uh, then we developed uh, an app, marketing, uh, finance, and I did that for two years. It was really, I couldn't say, you know, like in. in <laughs> I've been jumping different projects quite a lot. So it was a distant, you know, distance for me. Um, and the problem there, first of all, was very cool experience. Again, because you had full departments, you had full responsibility. The investors were not paying kind of or managing much. So it was like we had a lot of freedom. And it was uh, around yeah. 2010, if I'm not mistaken, right? It was two th 2013 to 2015, to the end of 2015. Basically, during that time, we were in a long talks with, obviously, to look, uh, to, you know, try to sell ourselves to someone. And Food Panda were one of the players who were looking for Ukraine to enter. They really? actually an office. Yeah, they launched an office and they actually closed it uh, eventually. But they were like on, you know, trying to make the decision, should we buy this smaller player and uh, and you know grow on the on their base? And 
Uh, we actually went pretty far in that discussion. We had, you know, due diligence made. I had to make quite a few adjustments, you know, for at least to make the money flows, you know, as as, as good for them as possible. But then uh, 2014 came, and in Ukraine it was quite a big step. You're probably familiar with that, you know, Russia is trying to, you know, get on the land of Ukraine, and you know, it was a political risk risk to enter the country plus the financial risk because the exchange rate of ukrainian really dropped so obviously <laughs> to the <that's> moon <laughs> yeah food panda had to pull out and but i was kind of tired a little bit of this project because i couldn't like grow much because we were like no let's not do it because we're gonna sell tomorrow you know so you're kind of a bit on the same place so basically I asked Food Panda if uh, if they got anything for me, and uh, because we already kind of you know we knew each other, they saw the business, how it's managed, uh, and they proposed uh, to manage Food Panda Malaysia, uh, and that was pretty you know surprising and cool. Uh, actually, they were saying like, yeah, we're not sure, maybe maybe Indonesia, no no Philippines, maybe Malaysia. I'm like, what the hell, you know, like well, how do I choose? Yeah, I went on the internet trying to you know Google the the capitals, you know, Kuala Lumpur is it different from Manila? What's the lifestyle? You know, scary things about Manila, and I'm not sure where I want to go. So like, this was funny. So yeah, and they just uh, pretty straightforward. They gave a contract like, yeah, let's go sign it. I'm like, what the hell, you know, why not make a pretty cool move? move to a different part of the world, you know, without having no idea like what's going on, uh, but pretty comfortable with a, you know, like, with, for two years, you're managing this business model, like solely, you know, like you're, you're pretty confident in things that you know, you know, um, and before, like, because I had to have my work permit done and, uh, and they said, yeah, okay, like you have to travel, travel through India to Delhi and see our operations there because it's a like, huge I'm like, okay, and I've been to India before. You know, it's kind of a holy place. And obviously, you know, I'm not going to visit a lot of things, but still. So I landed in Delhi, go to the office, and it's huge. It's like, it's a few floors, you know, it's like hundreds of people. And I'm getting introduced to their GM and heads of departments, each of who have like three plus years of experience in McKinsey, you know. And I'm like, these guys were spending money and like top minds were working, finding solutions. That was like huge and thousands of years. I mean, after us having like, I don't know, 10 plus thousand of orders in equipage per month, you know, these guys were doing it, I don't know, per day probably. So it was an amazing scale. And yeah, after that, uh, once I got my work permit to uh, move to Malaysia, different world, obviously, you know, it's a combination of Kuala Lumpur and if you've, if you've been, yeah, it's like a jungle, it's like skyscrapers in the middle of the jungle. So you come out from the airport, you know, the trees are like, higher on top of you and and it's all brand new because it's like you know oil money you know it has it's been recently built it's not all it's not it's not like india at least the capital so yeah well, it was a funny new world and uh, when i uh, arrived i was kind of tired of being in this uh money losing business uh and what to change quite fast you know and i was quite confident about things that i arrived i remember I raised the delivery fee on my third day there, which was crazy. I like doubled it. So, like, no, the first thing that you did was like, <laughs> okay, we stopped losing. We we need to make yes. money. And uh, yes. what's yes. the best yeah. way we raise yeah. the price? Really? Yeah, that's what I did. I mean, like, I, yeah, but it was great because, like, I you know, I had the numbers. Like when I was flying in, they kind of sent me something, and I, I come around talk to the chief operating officer who is there. He was Dutch. Uh, and I just remember looking at the numbers and I'm like, you know, this doesn't make sense. I mean, I understood us being in Ukraine with that, you know, trying to get a sale. But here we are, you know, you're already established. You're in the market. You're, you're big. You're, you're a European company in Asia. Let, let's do something. You know, what am I here to do? You know, to continue dragging something didn't make sense to me. So I looked at unit economics. I saw how much we, but it was a very interesting stage because basically that time uh, um, the whole industry was switching from delivery version one to delivery version two, which is like from just passing on the orders to taking full responsibility and having their own couriers and delivering the, uh, the whole thing. And basically there were negotiations going with restaurants moving from 10% or 15% commission to 30 plus percent commission. So we had, we were at that stage then. Uh, so yeah, I, I had a role of uh, chief operating officer and for companies managing their roles as you always have CEO and COO like working in partnerships, the C operations basically more responsible for supply and you know contact center, et cetera, and chief operating more concentrated on sales and marketing. So that's what I did. When I came around, 
uh, whatever they had before there, but basically I had zero marketing department. They all just left the moment when I came. Uh, so I had to like rebuild it from scratch uh, and later on took over the sales. But uh, yeah, uh, fast forward to, to, to just shorten my story on the food delivery. When that finished, I got stuck a bit in in, in Asia. Uh, moved to but that Bali. was all before Delivery Hero, right? That was that was independent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where yeah, yeah, yeah. you you were just that's true. That was to sell. Was there like was a sale uh, the goal back then, or were you building like an independent? Okay. Um... Well, at that stage, I mean, everybody was, you know, throwing around Rocket Internet name, right? And they still are because Rocket Internet is big. They're they're massive. They they do things really fast, really big, often successful. Nobody even, you know, so lots of people even put in their CVs or LinkedIn that would put Rocket Internet instead of Food Panda because, like, hey, we're that big. So I guess it was a venture. So uh, I don't remember what. The percentage of ownership of Rocket Internet was, but I think it was something like closer to 40, maybe even more percent. I don't remember. And I think it was because Delivery Hero was established in, in uh, developed countries mostly, and Food Panda was going for emerging markets. So I think it was like a venture pro, you know, project within the venture project, which was like, and the rest raised something like 300 million before I joined them. And uh, this is why the you know crazy spending that I've seen in India, for example, um, which is hell was hell of a battle, you know, because big players were fighting for market share and you know millions were spent and you know it was like win or die. Uh, so we Food Panda was I, I think in like 40 countries, but nearly all of them like really, really developing countries, right? So we were, I don't know, Vietnam, uh, small things, and uh we actually owned delivery club uh leader in russia at that moment really that was, yeah when i was there yeah i didn't so, know so yeah it was uh later on so basically what i think happened is they raised all that money they tried very good uh lots of things asia was doing pretty well by the way in comparison like india wasn't one it didn't work out very well in russia so i think uh again 2000 what was it 15 i think they had trouble raising big new funds uh, I don't remember what was happening on the financial markets, but I do believe that it was harder to raise than anyone assumed. Uh, and I think uh, it was just a rocket internet basically decision to unite the projects because they were heavily invested in delivery hero. And so they kind of merged basically the whole thing. They sold off delivery club to, to Russians, Melru, I think. Uh, and yeah, so, I mean, Partly in some countries, Food Panda is still doing very well, and they're doing tremendously in Asia. Oh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. So, like, so it, it was like you know, on the grand like macro scale, yes, it didn't work out as a separate entity, probably because of the funds. But Delivery Hero was standing very you know strongly on its legs, you know, like having money from its established markets. The problem with Food Panda is was like everything was emerging, you know, and everything was a test, and everything was kind of going through at the same time, and it's really you know to try to be present in 40 markets, some of them huge, including India and Russia, you know, with all the spendings, it's, and basically inventing the bicycle on the go, because, you know, they were, they bought the company who were doing the, the logistics part with dispatching the orders, and we were integrating it and renegotiating all the contracts with partners like around the globe. I mean, it was, it was tremendous. So yeah, uh, but I was at the time when basically it would it, they recognized that you know the bird was crazy. We were GMs were gathered in, in Berlin and said like, okay, guys, remember we raised lots of money. Well, you know, with our spending, you know, it's going to be like six months left. So in three days, you have to come up. How do you cut down to these these numbers? Uh, and yeah, though I was like, you know, um, I you know. I was blamed in a way for like killing the market because obviously you're, you know, when you do a double uh, size delivery fee, you know, you slow down your growth in orders for sure, right? But economically, we were so much healthier. So we were not cutting, we were not firing anyone. We're countries, some, some had to cut like hundreds of people, you know, and it's a mess usually. It's like, it's pretty heavy, right? In reputation wise, in some countries, like uh, couriers were blocking the offices, like uh, heavy things going on, but you know, it happens when you when you flow in the millions and when you start putting a break in it, it's pretty 
hard period. So anyway, but again, what was happening, what I was doing in Food Panda, but it was, it seemed crazy, but yeah, I wasn't doing it like on my own. I wasn't in contact with uh, Berlin at that time or HQ. And, you know, in, with analytics, we kind of planned it out. We did a test on a small area. We added areas. We've seen a drop of like maybe 20, 20 to 30% drop of orders, but economically, you know, on, on the unit economics, we're doing way better, right? So, and that to me makes that made sense. I would rather like, Re-establish it to a normal uh, state of like break-even, and then continue the growth from some reasonable point, you know, and maybe like switching off the delivery fee, et cetera, et cetera. So what I was doing kind of made sense to me. Um, it, but again, you have to set your mind that the whole venture capital game is a little different from normal business building game. So it's uh, you either are trying to make profit and you know and, and survive. So either you see business as an entity as a human being which you know has to spend uh, not more than it makes which kind of makes sense right or in venture capital it's a bit of a different game it's sometimes uh, like uh, confusingly counterintuitive right you the, sometimes you need to waste more money to be more attractive and and growth sometimes is more important very often right in these cases and i guess this was again one of those cases and it, you have to you have to be prepared to be working in, in startups, especially in these kind of industries, which are tremendously growing. You have to know what you're doing and why you're doing. Because sometimes, like I had sometimes weird thoughts, like because you're working very hard, especially when you're foreign, you know, you don't have spend spend much time outside. You, you spend most of the time in the office in different city, and you're kind of spending lots of hours. And, and then you think, you know, what am I trying to achieve? Because we're not making any money, you know, where is it going? You know, and yeah. I think this is very important to, to the big companies who are doing this globally or who are playing this game of, of you know, capitalization. You have to have a settled message which you're able to bring down to your troops, you know, especially leaders, because they have to know what to transition down below. What's the vision? The master, you have to explain things, right? If, if we're burning billions today, you know, where is it coming to? Are we ever going to make money? You know, and you should have a vision of a theoretical twist, whatever, and you have to be ready to explain it. To start our uh, kind of conversation, I wanted to break it into two parts. The part before COVID, which is basically Food Panda uh, and everything that was going on in Asia, and then the what was happening after COVID, during COVID, and uh, what is happening at Rocket. Uh, so the first question that I wanted to ask you of your uh, food panda journey and uh, what was uh, happening back then. Could you please share uh, the vision of uh, of the market and uh, competition back then? Because you you just mentioned uh, in your journey that uh, when you were stepping in, uh, you saw that the business was losing money and you raised the uh, the prices. What was the general situation back in? Uh, uh, 2016, 2017, when you were uh, joining the uh, startup? And uh, how did the market look like back then from the competition perspective and uh, from the uh, goals that you saw ahead of you? And uh, well, what, what were you imagining the market back then? Uh, okay, okay. Um, first of all, Right. So what I've seen from my part service in, in Ukraine, and this was big my concern that also that, you know, 10 to 15 percent commission was not doing it. And this was the moment when this kind of enlightenment was obviously hitting everybody in the industry, not just me, because when you don't deliver and try to pass on the orders, you're, you're, you, you cannot control the quality of all the delivery. But the client still is blaming you for the service not done correctly. So he ordered from a like, He doesn't care about the restaurant because so in UK it doesn't help explaining to him that the restaurant didn't deliver or anything. So it was obvious that you have to take responsibility bigger, but you needed more money because it just economically didn't work out. Um, so and I and I've been looking for those ideas and actually I had an interesting talk with the 
with the launcher of Food Panda in Ukraine who was trying, you know, before they decided to acquire us, which they later didn't. But we had interesting talks and I understood that I, I'm not the only guy thinking it. And he was telling me through how he had ideas, you know, of building up the margins, you know, doing additional services for the restaurants, like maybe selling them marketing packages, et cetera. So that talk and these thoughts were obviously around the globe, uh, you know, the same way. So when I joined Food Panda and I landed in Malaysia, they were already at a stage when they, consciously decided to go with this version two, you know, with their couriers and delivering the full cycle. And they knew the new goal for the commission is 35 plus, you know, up to 40, depending on the margins of what they can negotiate with. Of course, not including big players like McDonald's, KC and stuff, because they don't have that margin basically, or and they know that they're the driver of the orders. So even back then already they knew that they will be the driver of the orders even like course, back way I mean, back they knew that well I mean it's not like you know 100 years ago but everybody knows that you know you put like we were in negotiating so I've met with McDonald's you know as from like our service back in the days as uh, and as from with Food Panda back in the days in Malaysia you know it was a global negotiation you know and it was fun finally signing them in Ukraine from rockets so it was you know lots of years of relationship in a way um, so so what I'm saying is it was a transition of the whole business model and but I I knew the unit economics that's why I did what I did in Malaysia straight away you know no no matter how funny it seemed but because I honestly believe that, you know, there's only so long you can take as being, uh, you know, negative on the bottom line, but you have to, I would rather, you know, find a way to be on a break even than finding ways to grow out of it, uh, or at least have a good understanding how to achieve it. So to answer your question, I think the business was in transition stage and it really believed that the mar- if you push the margins, you know, from 15 to 35 and to 40, because then the business didn't yet understand and what was the limit now it's more or less settled already in the markets then it was like ah let's let's ask for 40 you know and like and we're going to these partners and telling us there's no way we're going to give you 40 we're like no you we do this and that but again and the cool part what i saw in malaysia in comparison to you know what i've seen in ukraine is because we gms we had uh reports from all over the globe Right. So basically every week uh, you get this kind of overview of 40 countries, different parts of the world, average basket size, cost of delivery, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it's eye opening because that's when I understood kind of I understood that Ukraine isn't the easiest country because of far, you know, we're not a, we, we are an emerging country still, I believe. Right. And the oh, purchase is, is, a, is a game changer. Right. And you kind of know it. But when you physically see it on reports, it's like. To me, it's like poker playing. You know, everybody says in poker, you have to know what table to choose to play for before anything, right? Because like, if you go with the pros, you know, there's good luck with that, right? If you see guys who are just doing it for fun and they're drunk and they're ready to spend money, go there because you're going to make money there. It's a bit the same with the choosing the countries because so main, main trade. So obviously, like if the people don't have money to, to eat out all the time, well, but even by all the time, I mean, like, one week plus, uh, once per week or plus, you know, it's, it's impossible. If it's a if it's a holiday or if it's a celebration for people and they're doing it once per month, you're gonna do tremendously in 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 operations and in marketing, but you can only do that much, you know, and then you'll be killing yourself. What am I doing wrong? You know, but if you would take this same professionals basically and these same actions in a developed country. So in a way, in a way, like well done delivery hero for you know doing it beforehand in established markets where there are unit economics where where people have money to go out and eat. But again, things are changing, right? That's why emerging markets are still so have so much potential because they are growing, maybe not as fast as everybody assumed. Because when somebody's saying, you know, this is a growing market, well, you know, it's not going to change tomorrow. <laughs> it's going to be growing during the next 10, 20 years. You know, that is a big hopefully so, if there is enough resources, if there is enough. Yes. Uh, no, I'm sure. I'm sure. Even Ukrainian lifestyle, you know. Whenever anyone's complaining, I'm always guys. Look, like, do you remember what it was like 20 years ago? You know, the difference is tremendous. The difference in lifestyle is tremendous, and, and it's like, uh, yeah. But when but when startup is there, you know, we don't live for 20 years as a startup, right? We usually like when when you get hundreds of millions, you have to deliver soon. So and yeah, you plan by quarter, and if you don't exactly, you get it by, by months, quarter. Then by you months, go. Right? 
Yeah. So if you're going into Philippines saying that, you know, things are going to change, well, they're not going to change the next month. No, sorry. But like if you're big enough to go through, then it's nice to be an established player there and catch this wave during the next five years. That's for sure. But don't be in the illusion that, you know, the purchasing power will appear just because you entered the market. Right. This whole transition was happening everywhere at the same time with raising the, with raising the prices, getting couriers and go into this new model. Everyone already globally understood back then that this is where the business is heading or should be heading or was like Malaysia one of the first um, adapters? No, no. Malaysia was obviously, you know, because like even for Panda had like 40 countries, right? So everything was happening in Malaysia was happening in all the 40 countries at the same time. And that's also one of the big troubles of when you're that big and trying to explode that fast because you basically, you know, you haven't proven the whole thing anywhere locally, but you're trying to replicate it at the same time. And this costs a lot of money, right? So you're, if you're inefficient, you're going to be inefficient in lots of places. But hey, I guess this is what startups do. It's a matter of, you know, this blitz scaling thing, which Flockery is, you know, praised for. It is, it's a double-edged sword, right? In one way, you go really fast, you try to, but then again, but if you're not sure in your business model, yet or if it's not finalized yeah you start making the same mistakes everywhere globally and very often it's done you know it's hard to get super super uh, hyped professional senior people right to scale 40 countries so uh, when i joined and i was like under 30 years old and and i was one of the senior guys as gms so so i was like thinking you know how old are the other guys you know and so they're <laughs> 24 25 you know just eyes shining and they were jump, you know, they were thrown to the country, go sign as many partners as you can, you know, do it, this blitz scaling, which is, you know, it, it is the mantra of, of rocket internet, basically. Um, yeah, so uh, that that's how it was in Malaysia when I came. So again, and my, my view was, okay, you know, like if I'm put here to, to make everything make sense, I looked into unit economics, I draw it out. I remember like, I don't know, pretty much in the beginning, uh, I gather in a meeting of our local tops, you know, of Malaysia, and I explained them my book. I showed them unit economics and I said, I don't see how we can make money like this. So like, let's do this and this. So I got confirmation of the team. And then I got with the HQ, uh, like with business intelligence, said, uh, this is what I'm going to do. But, you know, let's do it step by step. Let's do it region by region. And you give me feedback if it's working out. Um, so everybody was monitoring it. And it was, so we dropped like, you know, like, just below 30% in orders, but financially, you know, because the unit economics were doing 300% better. And I was wow. like, I'm fine with that. You know, but again, it depends what the goal is. This is very important, right? Because like, if, if someone knows that you would rather show, I don't know, 300% growth in orders, you know, to attract another 100 million, that's one story, yeah? Like, but then explain it to me, please, and tell me exactly what my role here is, right? Because when I come around and I'm fed up with being negative and I'm looking for common sense, because this is what, you know, the businessman does, uh, that I'm going to be looking for that. Yeah, so uh, basically, like, when after that, like, we were invited to Berlin for this grand meeting of all general managers, you know, from all the countries, I remember like Ralph uh, being CEO of Panda at that time, you know, like, dude, you're killing the market. <laughs> like, <laughs> I I, I'm, do, I'm, I'm doing what I I'm have to do. I'm the only one making money. How am I killing it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, yeah, I mean, and this is, uh, look, this is exactly how, you know, I thought and he thought. But the truth is somewhere, the truth to me is about, this is what I already mentioned, um, is getting a message across, right? So if you're playing the venture capital game and you know that, you know, you're about to attract whatever millions of bucks and that you just need to show off, tell it to your leaders, explain them what they're doing, okay? Because like, it might, like to me, if I don't understand that or I don't know what's the goal and that we're trying to raise something, you know, I'm going to be looking for efficiency and I'm going to be doing the best I can. And the, the worst part is if the guy's on top, it's going to be a tremendous miscommunication. Because when, if you're trying to do and you put your heart into delivering something and somebody's acting the opposite way, you know, you're going to feel very frustrated as a leader. You know, and I think that's what happened with me and for Panda. It's like, because like I was confident and I thought I was knowing what I'm doing, you know, but the guys at the same time now, like looking back, I do understand because first of all, and I kept on saying it to myself, I, with full respect to you know, Ralph and, and the, uh, and the whole kind of team who was managing it, it's not every day, you know, even like 
no matter what age you are, uh, you're, you're, you're managing a 300 plus million company, which is, you know, expanding into 40 countries. It is not, you can't have that experience. And it's really hard, to be honest. And you're under super stress when, you know, you're being called from, uh, you know, investors like, I don't know, Morgan Stanley and stuff, you know, like, where's my 100 million? What are you going to do tomorrow? You know, it's super stressful, right? So, uh, and yes, in a way, it's their responsibility to get the message across and to have it on your minds. But when you're trying to do it for your own team, which is way smaller, you understand how complicated and hard it is, right? Um, but it, but it, I do believe that these things are key, key, crucial things for for like global management and having leaders and motivating them. It was a key takeaway. So yeah, we we spread it quite friendly with sorry uh, with with Food Panda because like. I remember because like I was mainly talking to the global chief operating officer and he's, he was calling me because basically what was happening is like Foodbound already understood that they're kind of consolidating, I believe, with Delivery Hero. And they were, there was another big funny story that the HQ was based in Berlin where we had zero operations. In. And it was kind of so weird, you know, like because like how many you guys know what's going on? And they, were, they started redistributing the key roles, like head of global sales into countries, whatever. And, and, and they started to shrink down and everything. I remember before that, I asked the guy like, hey, please don't act, like, judge me on my actions, uh, judge me on results. And we had that kind of, you know, relationship with, with management. I remember the call when he made, he was, he felt like he was really like, sorry, because like, you know, everything was okay when we were talking about business, we're like no problem with the results, but it's just, you know, we have a little bit different style about what I'm saying. I said, it's fine. Don't worry. I understand. It's okay. Uh, yeah. So basically they put uh, someone from the, from the HQ office position, someone who was global sales in, into my position. And uh, I think I was quite happy to, to go all that stage because, because of this miscommunication, if you understood it right. Right. I was, I think I was trying to achieve different goals than the business had at that moment. This is actually a very interesting uh, question. From the perspective uh, of, uh, of the team, back then it was uh, Food Panda in uh, Berlin, and there were a lot of emerging markets all over the place and a lot of independent leaders in the local teams who were doing their thing and everyone was experimenting. You were experimenting with the fleet and the tariffs the prices of uh, delivery and commissions and whatnot. Somebody was scaling and expanding and was spending millions on marketing, not caring about the unit economics. If we look today uh, at the team uh, and the understanding of the business back then in general, was it the, uh, was it the calculated risk uh, in terms of understanding that the market will be that big and we need to expand and experiment everywhere to get as much experience as possible and get as many different views and leaders as possible? Or was it just like, okay, let's, we got this hundred million, we, we have a lot of cash, uh, we just want to do something and let's see what works, let's see what sticks. How do you feel like working back then and being on these meetings and seeing all this team? Uh, the, actually, the management team that is doing not the first uh, project right now. And uh, this is like right now, it's already a success story. But back then, what, what, did, it, what did it look like and how was it? Uh, okay. First of all, again, success is, you know, is the winner's like we were saying, right? Like write the success story, you could say. Success is a, is, a, is a word because could you say that Food Panda was a success? It depends how you twist it and look at it, right? So when it became part of Delivery Hero and, and you know, partly the parts of Food Panda which are successful and still have its own brand, it's a success. Was it a separate success of the whole campaign? In a way, you could say that it had to dial down and merge with the guys to survive. Right. So in that way, maybe it wasn't such a success. Right. So everything is like in life, you know, like until you give up, you cannot say if you lost or won. Right. So it's like if every and it were some there's another saying that uh, success is going from one failure to another without losing your enthusiasm. Right. So, so uh, it's, it's a Definitely. relative term, I believe. Right. So success can be either personal which we can kind of count in money or, or even business-wise, then I suppose you have to look 
what happened to the investors which put money in. And I don't know that. Probably they got parts of the shares with the deal of Deliver Hero. Did that, um, if they didn't exit that deal afterwards, probably they have more money now because of the growth of Deliver Hero and the stock market, et cetera, et cetera. But all I'm saying is it's all relative, right? Um, to, the, to, the, to the whole grand task of managing international... I think that this blitz scaling thing and rocket internet in part, right? Those three brothers, I believe, right? They, they brought this. Uh, cra- I think if you know financial markets, they're they're like uh, junk bonds of USA during the eighties, you know. So there was like investment banking, and then somebody created this crazy tool saying that what the hell, you can you can borrow money for the cheapest and, and, and small guys started eating up the big ones. So this is, I think, what Rocket Internet brought into the world. So this speed of scaling is one of the main parts of this business formula. So you take this business model that you saw successfully working and you go all in on it and there's a good chance that, you know, if it's already had a prototype working, because of the scale and because of being first there, you have a good chance of, you know, just turning this investment, multiplying it tremendously. Uh, and, and then because of the scale, then optimizing it, you know, as soon as possible. So the strategy is you come in, you boom it out. If it doesn't work, come out. So in a way that happened with the fund in general also. It was a grand scale kind of like push. Uh, they saw, they converted it back. They, you know, united with Deliver Hero and what survived, survived. So... I don't believe it's a conscious strategy to scale as much as possible to learn. No, it was a business model that they kind of that was understood. And with the blitz scaling strategy, you go all in, see what survived, and come out. That's it. Awesome. And we still see a lot of it every day today, right? I mean, like, like look at the, I don't want to name like okay, it's not that I'm worried to name names because I don't know their business inside out, right? But you, you hear of guys like Reels and stuff, you know, you pump up a billion, you know, and, and you see what happens, right? And on the way, hopefully, we'll find out how to make it profitable with the unit economics and everything else. But without scale, it's impossible because if they Absolutely. just do one job, you know, you need the scale, you need the scale to optimize. Uh, I, I have my own thing, and I don't know if it's really mine, but like whenever st- someone trying, so first you have to have something working to, to optimize it. When somebody's going into inside details, like let's first establish it. Once it's working, we can optimize. Plus, you need you need the intensity of orders, right? You need the the intensity of couriers to make everything tweak to to optimize things. If you just have one order per hour, then uh, good luck optimizing that. Or if you have like you know five partners in the city, right? You need five thousand partners. You need. 500,000 orders uh, and you know and as many couriers and then you can really optimize things definitely definitely without scale there is nothing there is nothing to work on you're absolutely right and uh, good luck uh, making something efficient what doesn't exist uh so from this perspective it's definitely something to learn from this story that you throw in and see what sticks and then optimize what is already stuck, right? And uh, from this perspective, yeah. it's definitely uh, one of the stories uh, which is still being optimized and which is still being scaled. And uh, we'll only see uh, in the next uh, years uh, how it's going to turn out eventually and uh, who is going to be the last one standing or not the last one standing but in general uh, who will be standing and what is going to uh, be the result of it eventually when you started your journey in rocket it was a small team how does the general uh, environment look like when you are scaling a lot of talent, a lot of money, and a lot of big goals. But at the same time, it's the industry uh, that has very high expectations, a lot of pressure. The level of uncomfort that you get used to is just tremendous. I mean, I think it only comes in comparison to to people who go in, in military. And it's a, it's a different, group of couriers that are going to work eventually because these guys are hiding away from orders, right? Because unit economics are just crazy bad, right? Because like it costs you 
very expensive to deliver one order and it doesn't make any economical sense but but you have to go through it right and then when after that you're able to switch off the hourly payment so to describe at that stage the mentality is you hustle every day and your goal is to survive